Hi, Leo. Better day today, isn't it? No frost. And here we are in the orchard amongst the damp leaves. You're being brave this morning, having your breakfast here on the rug. So we say our morning prayers. So, good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Tuesday, the 30th of November. It's a day when we break into Advent just for a day, just two days after we started, because just as we began the month of November with All Saints Day, today we have another important Saints Day. The 30th of November is St Andrew the Apostle, the fisherman called from his work and his nets to follow Jesus and to become a fisher of people instead. So we've come by the, the fish pond here, uh, which is covered and surrounded with leaves falling in this autumn weather. Very, very different day today. No frost and not really very cold. And we're going to say our prayers together. Bring your own concerns from across the world. Many nations honour St Andrew in different ways and among them, of course, Scotland. Uh, and we think of this city and university of St Andrews on this particular day as we say our prayers together. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom. Blessed are you, sovereign God, ruler and judge of all. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of this age that is passing away, may the light of your presence which the saints enjoy surround our steps as we journey on. May we reflect your glory this day, and so be made ready to see your face in the heavenly city, where night shall be no more. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God for ever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind, as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm on this 30th and last day of the month is Psalm 146. Alleluia! Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live will I praise the Lord. As long as I have any being, I will sing praises to my God. Put not your trust in princes, nor in any human power, for there is no help in them. When their breath goes forth, they return to the earth. On that day all their thoughts perish. Happy are those who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps his promise for ever, who gives justice to those that suffer wrong and bread to those who hunger. The Lord looses those that are bound. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the stranger in the land. He upholds the orphan and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign for ever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Alleluia. We could have chosen many lessons today on this feast of St Andrew, for he appears in different ways in the Gospels. In fact, I've chosen the first chapter of the Gospel of St John, and I'm beginning at verse 35. We are in the company of John the Baptist. So we imagine we're by the River Jordan, and we're certainly not in Galilee, as we shall see. But Jesus is there amongst the disciples of John the Baptist. And there are others there too. And the story's already begun to be told. And so in chapter 19, 
one has, sorry, the verse 19 of chapter 1, we have the testimony of John the Baptist saying, I am not the one who is to come. I'm the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. At verse 29, we have a time sequence. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. And then in verse 35, and this is where we're starting, another time sequence. So let's begin this lesson. I'm going from verse 35 of chapter 1 up to verse 44. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard John say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two, who heard John speak and followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Kephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. I've read that passage early in St. John's Gospel because it gives an insight and a wonderful picture from an early source, first of all of the ministry of John the Baptist and those who followed him, also called disciples, among whom were those who would follow Jesus. And we hear that story unfolding with those time sequences, the next day, the next day, the next day. And we then go to the change of location. Jesus decides to go to Galilee, but by then the two disciples who were with John when he says, Behold the Lamb of God, and maybe they heard him speak earlier to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the people who've been sent from Jerusalem to question John, but what they do do is as Jesus is walking by there, no doubt by the River Jordan, in the area of Judea itself, then they follow Jesus. They become curious and Jesus turns and looks at them both. And we know from this account that one of them is Andrew. And Andrew and the other disciple ask Jesus where he's staying and Jesus says come and you will see it's the first step of knowledge before the Galilean call which is accounted and given an account of in St Mark and St Matthew and St Luke and 
They spend the day with Jesus and the first thing that Andrew does with this good news that he now has had underlined and his mind is made up, he goes to his own brother Simon and brings Simon to Jesus. And Jesus says to Simon, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called, in the Greek, Kephas, and then you go to the Latin, Peter, the rock, is the meaning of all of this. Sometimes in our New Testaments we hear him called Kephas in the epistles, but mostly he is known as Peter, or Simon Peter. And Andrew then begins to take a place in, shall we say, uh, an outer circle, although he's always there named in the first four apostles in any list of the twelve, and Philip always becomes number five. But when they move to Galilee, Jesus calls Philip, and we're told that Philip was of the same lakeside town as Andrew and Simon Peter. And we know that Andrew and Simon Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, are fishermen. They are lakeside people. This is a building up of discipleship. And in that early part of St John's Gospel, we get the wonderful sense of Andrew already being the one who is finding people because he's desperate to convey this good news which they've all been waiting for. And it's conveyed by the humanity of the Anointed One which he is now beginning to discover, Jesus. And he and the other disciple have spent the day with him. Now they go to Galilee. The scene shifts in St John's Gospel to the lakeside. He calls Philip and we're told he was of the same town as Andrew and Simon, as they'd called him up, up till that moment. And Philip calls Nathaniel. That's how the chapter goes on, you remember. Uh, Jesus then finds Nathaniel uh, and calls him and talks about having seen him before under the fig tree. These are small communities. They in fact Bethsaida and also Capernaum, well, uh, well, where they will go are more sophisticated in terms of trading communities than Nazareth, where Jesus himself has come from. And when Philip, you remember, says to Nathaniel, it, Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel is filled with scorn about the lowliness, if you like, of Nazareth, the country place, and they are on the, the, the trade routes. And also, they come from families, Simon and Andrew and James and John, families of tradespeople with their fishing business. We can read the story of the call of St Andrew, which is part of the Gospel for St Andrew's Day. Jesus calls Andrew and Simon from their nets to follow him and to become fishers for people, to leave the job that they know well. It's second nature to them. And he finds them again uh, with a casting net in the uh, synoptic accounts of, of Mark, uh, standing by the lakeside, casting a net with its weights over inshore fish. They know their business, these fishermen, and they're used to the waters, but it causes them to respect the waters. And later in the accounts, in their boat, on the waves of the Sea of Galilee, they are terrified, as they are as fishermen. They respect the wind and the waves, but they respect even more the one who gives tranquility and a calling, not only to the winds and the waves, but to their own lives. I said he was on the sort of outer rim. I could have read another story from St John's Gospel of the feeding of the 5,000. I read it at Evensong in the cathedral last night, because there, in St John chapter 6, we find as Jesus feeds the 5,000, it is 
a resource provided by the, the, the noticing of Philip and Andrew of the lad who has five loaves and two fish. And the fish, of course, becomes the sign of the Christian presence, especially in persecution. We dealt with that very recently, the Greek word ichthus, and the two arcs which make up the fish of a secret sign in those days, found in many places. But not then. The loaves and the fish were really the lad's breakfast. But who noticed? It was Andrew and Philip. They tend to be on the outskirts of things. What is that among so many? Jesus answered the question. And at the end, remember, the fragments make 12 baskets. 12 disciples, 12 baskets. Just as at the uh, wedding, Cana of Galilee, which follows close on the heels of what I read this morning, the six great water jars and the six disciples sitting there at that time who've already been called. These numbers are signs which give a sign of something much, much greater, much, much more infinite. A sign of the Anointed One, which John the Baptist is already recognising and pointing them in the direction of, but they don't understand fully yet. We could read another story from St John's Gospel, all about Andrew, and it's now in the days before Jesus himself is arrested and betrayed and crucified, and it's with Jesus talking in the temple courtyard to the crowds. And you all remember there's some Greeks who are like tourists who've come and are allowed in the outer courtyard of the temple. They want to see Jesus. And so what do they do? They don't go right up. They're too shy to go right up to the centre. But they find someone on the outskirts. First of all, Philip. And they say, sir, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip tells Andrew, these two so often together, and it's hardly a wonder, they all come from the same uh, small town on the side of the lakeside at Galilee. And here they are in the big capital of Jerusalem, but the two are together as friends. And what happens? Philip tells Andrew, Andrew and Philip go to Jesus. And Jesus' answer to that question, we would like to see Jesus from what we might call foreigners coming in to that moment in the outer courtyard, is the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all peoples, all nations to myself. The hour has come. Andrew is involved in all of that. He is someone who notices those who are unnoticed. He's someone also who knows Jesus well enough from the very beginning to go up to him and say, these people are keen to see you, and brings them through, giving encouragement to those who were shy about asking to see Jesus. He's left the work that is natural to him and finds a completely different kind of work, which will be his life's vocation. But nevertheless, all those working skills stay within him. I've chosen two dates today, and uh, they are of people who you may well have heard of and you may not. But both of them speak about a, a natural activity, but also something else in their life which is, is a, a skill to them. And these things of using natural gifts, but enjoying also other things that maybe we're not so good at, but that we enjoy better doing because the, 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 the way that one's working through becomes something almost like a, a job of work and you need encouragement from other dimensions. Now the first one is a date of a person who retired on this day, on the 29th of November, 2013. He's 93 years old and he is called, or best known to us, 
as Dr. D.G. Hesseon. And he's best known to us in that title because of a series of books that he wrote and published over the years, making him the best-selling non-fiction writer in the world. And the series have sort of unprepossessing names. <clears throat> they started in 1959 with an imaginatively coloured, quite short booklet, but with multiple pictures attracting people to it. And it was called Be Your Own Gardening Expert. And in 1959, that book was published and it's been reprinted, reprinted, reprinted oh so many times because people want to be a gardening expert, many of them as a hobby of encouragement. And we call ourselves a garden congregation. So David Hessian is someone who would be attractive to us. But it didn't end there because the book was so successful with its pictures and its tips and the way in which he set things out in very simple forms, then he followed them up, this particular book up, and his tips up, with so many other books. Be your own houseplant expert. I remember my mother having that book when she was looking after houseplants in the house. And she became an expert at that, with the help of Dr. D.G. Hessian. Be your own lawn expert, be your own rose expert, vegetable expert, tree and shrub, shrub expert, flower expert, greenhouse plant expert, rock and water plant expert, bulb expert, bedding plant expert, fruit expert, herb expert. It goes on. And also there are books which help with garden diseases or the way things are set out. On and on in a successful way of helping people to discover new vocations or else just giving them tips of what is enjoyable in life in joining in with the creator's creation by being creative themselves. A person who never wanted the limelight much, David Hessian, and Mostly, he succeeded in that, although his name is everywhere on those books and you can certainly still find them and get them sent to you on Amazon, either second-hand or, or new. But at 93, I hope he's pleased with the vocation he found to help people, encourage people, be creative and also have respect for the Creator's creation. As we said, Andrew, as a fisherman, would have respect for the winds and the waves and the fish themselves. He knew what he was doing, and yet he was called to a different vocation, much, much more dangerous than the winds and the waves, and we remember that calling today. So, as we think of all of that, and maybe one could remember that hymn which we always sing today, Jesus calls us all the tumult of our life's wild restless sea. Day by day his sweet voice soundeth, saying, Christian, follow me. As of old St. Andrew heard it on the Galilean lake. It's a hymn for his day, but it talked about the winds and the waves and the tempest, not only of the Sea of Galilee, but also of the life he was to lead. But always in the background, he had that sense of the skill he had as a fisherman, which he shared with his brother Simon, now called Peter the Rock, and shared with James and John, who had left their father Zebedee and all the nets in order to follow Jesus, and with Philip from the same seaside place, Bethsaida, and other disciples who would come along, but at the same time they each had their own vocation. Andrew on the outskirts, mostly unnoticed, finding people like the lad with the loaves and the fishes, finding people like the Greeks who want to see Jesus, and inadvertently 
leading them to him so he can say, the hour has come and I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. There's one other name and as it's connected with Kent, I'm going to use this one too this morning. And this person was born on the 30th of November, 1554. He was Sir Philip Sidney and he was born at Penshurst, still the home of the Sidney family, now Lord and Lady Delisle, and uh, for many years uh, uh, Philip de Lisle was our uh, Vice Lord Lieutenant and then the Lord Lieutenant of Kent and we extend our greetings to him and to Isabel um, uh, now uh, because he has retired from that and is, is living quietly at Penshurst. We also remember that his son and heir, another Philip Sidney, who will become, will, who will become Lord de Lisle, is a scholar and in the footsteps of his uh, first Philip Sidney, who I'm talking about now is the Philip Sidney, but let's remember also the uh, Lord de Lisle's massive connection with this place as president of our trustees of the, the Canterbury Cathedral uh, trustees here and the time that he gave to that was something which we are immensely grateful for to both him and to Isabel. Well, I'm talking though about this ancestor, uh, Sir Philip Sidney, and he was born on the 30th of November, 1554, at Penshurst, and was set to be a great soldier and statesman, and had all the qualities and connections. He was the nephew of Queen Elizabeth's favourite, Robert Dudley, who became Earl of Leicester, and also became the son-in-law of Sir Francis Walsingham, the Secretary of State, all of those things. But there was a side to him which actually knew that most of all he wanted to write and to write beautiful poetry and he did he couldn't stop himself writing he was called to be a soldier and he died as a soldier at the age of 31 in Arnhem in the Netherlands in 1586 and was brought home and was given the one of the, the, the largest and most magnificent funeral processions to old St Paul's Cathedral. But that secret side is the side that remains. The secret side of writing sonnets almost as beautiful as Shakespeare. And his sonnets, which were in a collection, Astrophel and Stella, become a signal of the scholarly, imaginative and artistic life of the whole of the Elizabethan age at that time. Elizabeth was canny, Elizabeth I, and she never set him a diplomatic or soldierly task too hard for him, for she must have sensed that here was someone with an artistic and literary spirit as well. Different creative gifts. Being a soldier because it was expected of him, being a statesman, a diplomat, because it was expected of him. But at the same time, uh, mixing with people across Europe and even going to see the exiled Jesuit Edmund Campion and having com secret conversations with him, not for any diplomat, just, just because other people's creativity and spirituality was something that he himself wanted to embrace and set down in verse two completely different vocations and at the same time it was Shakespeare who got all the glory and Philip Sidney with beautiful sonnets and I've only mentioned that particular set of them there's so much more that he gave to us and other poets like Edmund Spencer were tremendously admiring of Philip Sidney but Philip Sidney's name not so well known as Edmund Spencer. Andrew's name, not so well known as Simon Peter. But the one who, by noticing and using his new gifts, not in fishing, but in the same kinds of intuition that he had on the lake with the fish and the winds and the waves, brought people to Jesus. First his brother, and finally, in the last days before the the, the, the Christ, the anointed one, is lifted up, finally, 
those Greeks in the temple courtyard who with the simple question said, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And in bringing them forward, Andrew said to Jesus, uh, they'd like to see you, no doubt. And Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I, when I am lifted up, will draw all nations, he could have said, like these folk here, to myself. Thanks be to God then for St. Andrew on this day and his particular gifts. Let's say our prayers. Today we are praying for the Diocese of Ife in the Church of Nigeria and we're praying also for the Sandwich Deanery, that's the, the villages around the town of Sandwich here, quite near us. We pray for the clergy and people of that area deanery and for Chris Spencer, the area dean, this morning and all those who are officers of the Deanery Synod. Pray for Justin, our Archbishop, and for Rose, Bishop of Dover, Emma, Bishop at Lambeth. And we use today, first, the collect for St. Andrew, the Apostle. Almighty God, who gave such grace to your Apostle St. Andrew <clears throat> that he readily obeyed the call of your Son, Jesus Christ, and brought his brother with him, call us by your holy word and give us grace to follow you without delay and to tell the good news of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And bring your own intentions and prayers now as we say the Advent Collect. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility that on the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God now and forever. Amen. So we say, each in our own language, the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of, uh, I was going to say silence, but there are, there are jays up in the, in the ash tree having a complete scrap. Four of them up there. Three of them. Four of them. You can probably hear them. So, a time for reflection.
Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you. Scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen. Tears and sighs and blows.